a lot of familiar faces, so I won't spend too much time introducing myself. The way I view this, this is about a nine or ten hour exposure of us all to each other, and it's too short a time to uh, teach an orthodox ethnobotany class or even a survey course in ethnobotany. But it's, it's longer than the normal hour or two hour talk with questions that I give. So I'm hopeful that there will be a lot of interaction and that you've come prepared with questions and that you have special interests that we can develop as we go along. Uh, it would be possible for me to simply teach this like a, uh, a survey course and explain to you the state of the various disciplines which bear on ethnobotany and ethnopsychopharmacology and shamanism. But I think it would be more useful if I stated my own bias and then sort of presented the information from that point of view because the people who have created the modern science of ethnobotany really didn't intend to do so. It's one of these hybrid sciences like folk taxonomy, ethnobotany, that arise when one discipline seems to overlap uh, into another, so that no real firm foundation for thinking about what ethnobotany and ethnopsychiatry, what these things really are, was ever laid. And I think, uh, by way of sort of a preliminary suggestion as to how that might work, that uh, we have to think about two factors which form human populations and human experience uh, generally. And these are geography, which creates the context in which we find ourselves, and language, with which we create the context uh, we would wish to be in. So we sort of are uh, bound by geography, but freed by language. and. Uh, this has uh, this has led to very interesting situations. The geographical and biogeographical facts which lie behind a given area are not very frequently present in the minds of anthropologists or even botanists who investigate these areas. Um, for instance, two two portions of the Earth's surface that I have familiarity with are uh, Malaysia and uh, Indonesia and the Amazon Basin. And these are two very different kind of situations. What you have with uh, Indonesia is the abutting of a shallow ancient continent against the Eurasian landmass, so that at the place in Thailand called the Isthmus of Kra, what you actually can see there is the migration of Eurasian species and Austral Indian species across a migratory line. So there's an intermixing of flora and fauna at that point. The number of species in an ecology is directly related to the uh, utilizability of the environment by human populations. And this is true of foods as well as drugs and poisons and other kinds of uh, intoxicants. So that there are two situations in which you get ultra-dense uh, speciation. Um, continental land masses which have been above water for very long periods of time uh, so that evolution has gone on uninterrupted by catastrophism. And the two most obvious examples that biogeographers study are uh, the Madagascan, oh thank you, the Madagascan uh, land mass 
which includes Seychelles and Madagascar and portions of India, and the South American continent. The South American continent has been above water about 120 million years. So that's 120 million years of continuous speciation at the equator. So there's an extremely dense number of species there, uh, sometimes uh, up to several thousand per square mile. And this is a situation that you don't get in the temperate zone. Temperate zone forests tend to be monocultural and to have a low species density. Sometimes, uh, uh, for instance, the Canadian forest is comprised by about 20 species. This is why the um, no animals or plants, plants, no, plants, uh, climaxed so-called tundra forest is a very uh, so-called monocultural climax. Brian, could I uh, ask you to go to the car and get the big box, which is in the back of the... Uh, Chevy. It's parked down the street a mile. <laughs> if you could bring the whole thing, that would make it easier. So this is the situation that you start out with, is these intense interrelationships between human beings and plants require species-dense floral environments. Uh, to get going. Now the situation, the reason there is a species dense environment in Paramalaya, as it's called, is because two continents are colliding there and the species from both sides are drifting and intermingling so that in Malaysia, even though it's a small land mass, not a continental land mass, you get very, uh, very dense speciation. You see, all of Indonesia was once a continent called Sundaland, very recently, in fact, perhaps as recently as a couple of million years ago. And then with the rise of the sea, this continent was turned into a series of islands, and speciation uh, proceeded on each island according to the constraints of that particular ecosystem. And with the rising <clears throat> and falling of the sea level and the islanding and reuniting of different land masses over several cycles of glacial melt, uh, it, was, it acted as a pump for evolution. And you see a fantastic species density there as well. So, for people interested in, in the ethnobotany of hallucinogens, this poses a problem because the distribution of hallucinogens is very lopsided in favor of the new world. In other words, uh, of 800,000 more or less angiosperms that have been classified, uh, only 20 or so are major hallucinogens even though several thousand contain uh, psychodynamic alkaloids of one sort or another. But the problems which interfere in their utilization are, range from low concentration to coincidental appearance with a toxic compound of some sort. This is why, and there are borderline cases, drugs that where a hallucinogen will occur with a toxic or emetic compound but has still been utilized culturally. For instance, uh, morning glory seeds are a good example of that. The seeds of Ipomea purpura, which is a, uh, a new world convolvulaceous climber, a morning glory, contain uh, um, compounds which are related to LSD but active uh, in a magnitude larger dose. But also coincident with this compound occurs ester coumarone, which is a very strong emetic, makes you vomit. So uh, folk utilization of these morning glories had to develop a way to separate these things out. And this is one of the issues that ethnobotanists have to grapple with and, and students of culture generally, which is how has it happened that these plant interactions have been discovered and utilized uh, by people? And it isn't only plant interactions, it's strange dying, I mean not only drug interactions, it's uh, 
strange dyeing technologies, technologies for etching metal, technologies for uh, curing wounds, all, how did they know what to do with each particular plant? Uh, for instance, uh, uh, a case about which we'll hear a lot this weekend because I will talk about it and tomorrow my brother will come in and talk about it as well, is uh, this uh, drug complex in South America called ayahuasca where two plants are brought together, neither of which is particularly active by itself, but together they utilize the pharmacological principle of monoamine oxidase inhibition and uh, create a powerful hallucinogen. So when you go into the field, you have to uh, bear in mind the background geography, thank you, of the situation. For instance, the Amazon situation is unique on the planet. The Amazon is the largest river in the world. It's estimated that uh, 20 to 30 percent of the world's oxygen is being generated by those forests. And yet, uh, the Amazon is a river which once flowed to uh, the opposite direction before the separation of the African and South American continent 120, uh, 220 million years ago, there was a river which f rose in the mountains of Niger and flowed west across the vast expanse of what was then uh, a portion of Gondwana land. Is that right? I think so. And it emptied into the Pacific Ocean and then when the continents separated, there was uh, subduction of the Nazca Plate under the South American continent, and the entire continent shifted very, very slightly. But because it was basically planar, this slight shift was enough to reverse the flow of the river. And then, of course, the Andes rose, and they're still rising. And so this uh, ecological uh, catastrophe, if you wish, looms very large in looking at the way species were distributed through the Amazon. Now all these things went on long, long before the advent of man, but they explain the species distribution, the situation as, as human beings found it when they entered the new world. And once and when that happened, and the dates now are very controversial with the most radical people saying that it was up to two million years ago, which is considered absolutely unsupportable by the mainstream anthropological opinion, which thinks, you know, that a date of 60,000 years is very high. But whatever happened, it appears that people entered the Amazon uh, both by the Caribbean islands, by a radiation which came down across North America through Florida, through the Caribbean islands. There's one school that believes that Mexico was actually repopulated from the south, that the wave of migration was a great hook passing through the Caribbean and then up the Amazon. But there is very little data so that there are many competing schools about the history of early man in the Amazon. The point of view I just stated is that of this geographer Donald, La Donald Lathrop who studied the languages in the basin and concluded that based on the way cognates proliferate, uh, the languages must have been carried from the mouths of the rivers up to the headwaters. Previous to that, the anthropological theory that held was that um, large human populations could not arise in the rainforest and that civilization in South America was largely a montane phenomenon. The Incas and, and the San Augustine cultures and these cultures building always in the Andes and that when people moved into the jungle, they essentially uh, were subsumed and, and lost uh, uh, identifiable material culture, which is what the, the archaeologist is tracing these things by. 
Now it's not clear. Recent discoveries with side-ranging radar in the Yucatan showed that there, which is of course not South America but Mexico, but that there the Maya had very large areas under cultivation with systems of earthenwork dams and irrigation channels which allowed them a much greater carrying capacity for their civilization than had previously been suggested for them. This same sort of thing may have existed in the Amazon, but the evidence for it may be much harder to come by because the rivers are shifting so much because uh, the river changes its course so often. I mean, when you fly over the basin, you see um, rivers that cannot find their way, rivers that loop hundreds of miles back upon themselves, rivers that as they meander on each side of them, there are hundreds of what are called oxbow lakes, which are essentially thrown out uh, uh, crescent-shaped arms of the river that have then been left. Because, uh, because the Andes are a young mountain chain, earthquakes are frequent. I mean, I've not spent years in the Amazon, and I've experienced several earthquakes. And because the, the uh, land is so flat, these slight earthquakes are actually driving river change, change in the course of the river which reminds me of an, something else that I should mention, which is uh, to return to the point about the evolution of s dense species situations in plants. Before the advent of human beings as a cultural force on the planet, the major force, it's thought by evolutionary biologists, which drove plant evolution was uh, the meandering of rivers because you see the way evolution works is there is never much of it where there is a highly evolved and integrated ecosystem because that is a set of interlocking niches each of which is occupied. The place where evolution takes place is uh, in so-called uh, barren lands where it's up for grabs where whoever gets there first has the advantage. This is, and, and rivers, as they change their course, expose millions of acres every year of uh, bank. And it is this contest for who shall occupy the bank that was, before the advent of man, the major force driving uh, plant speciation. This is why we have weeds. If you look at what weeds are, weeds are annular plants which uh, produce thousands and thousands of seeds and which grow very readily. In other words, their strategy for survival is rapid growth and massive seed dispersal. This is a strategy which would only work in a barren land or open land situation. It would never work in a primary or climaxed ecosystem of any sort. Uh, so because the Amazon Basin is the world's largest river system, it, ha it has that going for it too, driving the engine of evolution. So it is a continental landmass, which always means uh, as the potential for plant and animal populations expands, there's always a greater potential for evolutionary drift. So that happens more on continents. And then it is equatorial, it's thought that evolution proceeds faster. Well, it's not that it's thought. It's obvious that evolution proceeds faster in the tropics because there can be continuous generations. For instance, in the butterflies or something like that, you don't get one brood a year. You can sometimes get up to six. Well, each mating season constitutes a, a, an opportunity for gene transfer and for the appearance of new characteristics. So this is another factor, the equatorial situation of these continents, uh, of, these, of the uh, South American continent and the submerged continent of <coughs> Indonesia, which presents itself now as an island chain. Uh, to return then to the human impact on, on the Amazon basin and the plant formation, though we cannot pick out the, the uh, irrigation channeling 
that has been visible in Quintana Roo, it's probably because of the shifting nature of the river. Lathrop and his co-workers have found kitchen midden soil a meter and a half deep uh, in, in various parts of the basin, which indicates very long habitation and, uh, and uh, extreme sedentariness of the population. In other words, we're not dealing here apparently with hunting and gathering groups. To have kitchen midden soil a meter and a half deep, people have to settle for several hundred years. It must mean that there's some kind of uh, agriculture, perhaps aquaculture, something like that the North American Indians practiced with wild rices, this kind of thing. So in this situation of very dense speciation, human uh, societies are inimical. We probably arose in this kind of situation, uh, though because human, humanity presumably arose in Africa, Africa is the most heavily human impact continent on a mass scale over long periods of time so that there is uh, low, specie, low species count in the forests and uh, large degrees of desertification, this kind of thing. Uh, for instance, again, using the side-ranging radar technique, but in a different mode, they were able recently to penetrate through the sands of the southern Sahara up to a depth of about 30 feet because the sand is transparent to radar and they uncovered uh, river courses that showed that north of what is today the Sahel, the uh, ancient Africa was very wet and it's in the same area that you get the Teselli frescoes where you see herders with their cattle and with shaman with mushrooms sprouting uh, all over their bodies in, in an area now where, you know, a camel is necessary to uh, traverse it. And this has happened very rapidly. So in the tropical situation with the high density of species, man utilizes plants and sifts the environment for foods, for medicinals, and for magical plants, and probably for early human beings, this appeared as an almost continuous spectrum. There were merely effects, the prolongation of life and the extensions of it through interacting with the plants. And of course, everything is animate. Earlier I mentioned the puzzle of um, how these things came to be known, how they came to be utilized. It's only because we insist on being uh, good 18th century ladies and gentlemen that we pose this puzzle for ourselves and then marvel over it because there exists in the literature authenticated instances where uh, anthropologists taking hallucinogens with native people have been present when people have discovered uh, alkaloid containing plants by being told by another plant. And this, uh, this method of discovery, which is irrational and therefore inadmissible by our cultural conventions, is probably the major way in which everything was known up until 500 BC, you know. I mean, these logical and analytical engines by which we place such great store only have come into being, really, in the last thousand years. But before that, we've had our major, perhaps as a species, our major achievements in art, literature, dance, theater, all of these things. So it's a very uh, conv a culturally conventionalized attitude to demand of these things that they behave rationally. The whole enterprise of anthropology, which seeks to set up, uh, you know, I don't know what, the second year graduate student as Cambridge as the zero point, and then measure all forms of humanity against this with various commentary and adumbration, is a very odd notion. I mean, I think if you're going to do serious anthropology, 
related to saving your own soul through finding out about other people, the first thing you have to do is very carefully examine the cultural conventions of your own society. You sort of have to do a deconstruction meditation on the taboos of your own tribe because they are many and various, let me assure you. <laughs> I'm sort of getting my second wind here and recovering from my late arrival and realizing that, you know, we're two-thirds in the wrong way back because I didn't get everything set up and all that. But I should have said at the beginning that uh, you can interrupt at any time with a question and I, I'm not entirely clear on who I'm talking to, whether I'm talking to hallucinogen enthusiasts, anthropologists, epidemiologists, psychologists, the police. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> maybe at this point, uh, we should let that serve as an introduction and go around the room and let everybody state their concerns and, uh, and then I'll pick up the pieces again. Should we do that? Why don't we start here? Or well, uh, I'm, I'm interested in the um, religious <coughs> aspect that, that um, taking some of these drugs has had for certain cultures and the effect of it in the development of the consciousness. Um, so comparative religious uh, interest. And so you must be interested in shamanism as the much. basis of that. Yeah. Well, same as yeah. Same anthropology, anthropology, the shamanistic angle on hallucinogens. Uh huh. Well, I'm similar. I'm interested in shamanism and uh, what can be revealed through these substances. Content of the experience. So that's a kind of psychological, phenomenological interest in the in the situation. Uh, I'm a psychology student here and a psychedelic enthusiast, um, and I'm really interested in, uh, I don't know, psychedelics is growth, how they use it in other countries, and uh, also if, if there's any applications for mental illness to mm -hmm. be with psychedelics. Um, I'm interested in transformation. <coughs> there are beings which are not ways through pharmacological ways, through whatever that may be, especially in the shamanic aspects, but also how that applies psychologically. Mm -hmm. um, I'm interested uh, basically in getting a, a view of uh, shamanistic practices of South America, especially in ways that they contrast to uh, the practices of this continent. North American okay. Indian shamanism. Interesting. I'm a, a dancer and an anthropologist, and I'm interested in the, in the relationship of, of all of these things to the Uh huh. So practical application. Um, so primarily interested in the imagery, psychedelic imagery, um, where that's coming from, either the brain or the plant or the culture, starting that out. The source of the experience. What is it? I'm interested in East West psychology. I'm interested in the biological aspects of transformation. Mm -hmm. So the anthropology. Uh-huh. I'm a psychology student here and I lightly explored shamanism and I'm just on the fringes of being interested in hallucinogens. And I lived in the Andes for a year and a half and oh, you did. I've gone down a piece of the Amazon. <coughs> but I only I wasn't into exploring the plant life at that time. I just into the culture, so. Which piece of the Amazon? The Napo. Uh huh. Oh, I know the Napo. Yeah. Uh huh. So, you, did you go from Ecuador down into Peru the whole distance? No, only really to the kind of the end of the Napo. The, um, only as far as Lima Cocha. Oh, on the border. Yeah. Yeah, that's quite a border. <laughs> yeah. Oh. 
uh, I study political science and political sociology and my theoretical interests where they uh, uh, call it the, the politics of consciousness. That's my theoretical interest. And my personal interest is that I am a, uh, an enthusiast is the right word uh, of hallucinogens, but interested in exploring. And my prior experience has been primarily in Mexico. Uh -huh. in Oaxaca. Uh -huh. Yes, well, that's one of the richest areas. The two areas where it seems to be concentrated, hallucinogenic shamanism, at least in the present context, is the Amazon Basin and Central Mexico. Yeah. In the back. I'm interested in uh, brain, minds, and magic. <laughs> he answers the telephone. <laughs> Well, so everyone must have been pretty bewildered by all that biogeographical. Uh, <laughs> 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 you still gotta find your way. <laughs> what was it all for? I just want to say one more thing about it. Uh, <laughs> geography is the visible condensation of time. It is literally. Uh, all that we have of time. It's somehow, when you have so much of it that you have to pile it up, you get geography. And uh, time is very much uh, what the psychedelic experience is about. It's about uh, you know, the time of your life, the time of the species, but also the time of the stones. And when I delineated us as being caught between geography and language, that's what I wanted to say. Geography is the most uh, condensed and uh, titanic form of time, and language is the most ethereal, etherealized and present form of time. And, you know, the trick is to realize that in the way that James Joyce must have realized it, because he understood, you know, that speech makes mountains, which is essentially what I'm saying. And I think this is a shamanic idea, the power of speech and the awareness of eternity. These are the two things, because the shaman really does, I think, when you get it out of Bora and out of, uh, you know, these outlandish languages that are not even literate languages. They've only been assigned alphabets for purposes of study. When you get these concepts out of those languages and into some kind of Platonic or Aristotelian or Hegelian or Heideggerian vocabulary, which we can understand, then you see that that's what it's about. It's about standing in eternity. And this is what gives them their superhuman uh, status. So let me talk a little bit about how I view shamanism generally, and then in the context of hallucinogens. Charles, one other thing is that you have talked more, uh, I hope you have talked more a little bit about the differences. It seems like South America is really two completely distinct regional ecosystems, the Andean Plateau. and, and like, if you can, to talk a little bit more about the difference between that and the jungle basin. Between the montane, montane and the and jungle. The and the plant-human interactions. Right. Two um, probably most of you are familiar with Merciliad's book, Shamanism, the Archaic Techniques of Ecstasy. Well, this is the book to read, not because everything it says is true, and in fact, I'll delineate my differences with it, but because it represents a compendious phenomenological approach where without judging, uh, the world is surveyed in an ordered fashion and the case is actually put in perspective so that we can for the first time see that these diverse magical religious practices and practitioners that exist all over the world at a certain cultural level and have a certain congruence of belief are actually part of a worldwide uh, 
proto-historical uh, religious system that is in fact probably the foundation of all religions because once you understand the shamanic complex it's very easy then to see how later religions like Hinduism, Jainism, uh, all of them arise on a foundation of shamanic motifs so that to, and, and Iliad uh, investigates and delineates the shamanic motifs and some of them are uh, ability, superhuman ability to handle fire, uh, shamanic flight, uh, ability to cure, which you mentioned, which is the primary social function of the shaman, which really, I think, puts in perspective the fad of shamanism which has uh, enveloped our culture recently because our stress largely though not entirely is on what the shaman experiences for himself but in these societies where shamanism is indigenous it is uh, for the curing it's almost as though uh, the the vision is the private payoff for being able to cure and this is the function that the shaman is fulfilling. Uh, these superhuman abilities, like ability to handle hot metal, ability to find lost objects, ability to foretell weather, ability to cure diseases, um, are very challenging to Western anthropology, and they always have been, because we can't uh, quite come to grips with it and there have been various ideas about it the most uh, promising ones I think leaning on the idea that the linguistic context somehow sets uh, you up for how you perceive reality but in what exactly this linguistic context consists we haven't really been able to discover the linguistic context becomes extremely plastic uh, under the influence of hallucinogens, where, in fact, the word can become flesh, almost literally. And uh, our, uh, we have to remember when talking about what you can do with hallucinogens, that our approach is, when we take them, I think, most of us, largely scientific, which is take the drug, do as little as possible, this is known as not interfering with the experiment, and see what happens. And this is a very useful technique. It's the one that I favor most of the time because I like my life pretty much the way it is and don't seek titanic transformations. But if you take these things and do things, dance, swing through the trees, expose yourself to wilderness isolation, and that sort of thing, I think it's pretty clear you can fairly quickly reach a place where other people have very little to say to you because our reality is, ling is a linguistic net which holds us all together. And when you leave the net, uh, you become what is conventionally known as crazy because you become um, privy to the workings of a reality which is different from other people's. In India, uh, public displays of madness have, are completely accepted and conventionalized. And even in the Indian situation, people do not withdraw from, from public life. They live out their altered state uh, in the teeming urban situation. More attractive to me, and I think illustrating my earlier point that all religious systems have a foundation in shamanism, is the ideal of the Taoist uh, sage who lives on cold mountain and cuts wood and carries water and experiments with minerals and plants and fungi and is too odd to talk to, too strange to have anything to do with. because And he seems to be privy to a superhuman life that makes his absence from court, his lack of property, his lack of family, his celibacy, all of these things uh, 
uh, don't bring him down because he is he is uh, experiencing this internal reality. Uh, it's not clear to what degree Taoism and Taoist shamanism is narcotic. Mersiliad, who or hallucinogenic, Mersiliad uses the word narcotic. Uh, one of the places, the major point, in fact, where I differ with him is he believes that that all narcotic shamanism is decadent. That uh, the techniques of uh, fasting and uh, ordeal and breath control and uh, the classical, if you will, techniques for invoking visions are, uh, ancil are, are precede in time narcotic shamanism. So that by the time a culture turns to a drug, even a plant drug, for the hallucinogenic experience, it's past its cultural peak. But I think that this was just based on not carefully thinking it through and formulating your opinion at a very early point in the history of the collection of the data, because it's now, I think, pretty well established that hallucinogenic drug-based shamanism is the primary shamanism, and that... Uh, historically. Historically, yeah. And that the evolution of these other techniques has to do with the unobtainability for various cultural reasons of uh, the preferred method of induction, which was a drug. We can, if you want to take a microcosmic case, the entire cultural history of India is haunted by the loss of Soma. The pinnacle of Indian civilization, the, the uh, writing of the Rig Vedas, the production of the Rig Vedas, occurred entirely under the influence and in praise of a plant of some kind called Soma, which was the good. And whatever it was, as the people who wrote the Vedas uh, invaded India, their cultural context shifted and it became lost and further lost, and further lost, and I think it would be very easy to make the case that the endless adumbration of techniques for the invocation of ecstasy and vision state in India has to do with this uh, cultural obsession with the recovery of the soma. And a uh, similar situation can be seen uh, with the case of Amanita muscaria which has been held up as the proto, the paratypical case of narcotic shamanism, basically because it was the first such case studied in depth by Russian anthropologists who around 1910 to 15 went to the Amur district uh, of the far eastern Siberia and studied uh, the Tungusic people who were using Amanita muscaria then. And the so-called classical shamanism that Iliad develops and that he measures all shamanic traditions against worldwide is the Siberian model. It is thought of as the proto-shamanism. It has all the elements, all the motifs are present in it. It's uh, somehow a, a, a in or case of the shamanic complex. At least he wants to take it so. Um, other people have held different opinions. For instance, Gordon Wasson felt that uh, narcotic shamanism was primary, that in fact the, the chance encounter with hallucinogenic plants in the environment uh, probably was the driving force behind the formulation of religion, that people working their way through an environment testing plants and eating them would eventually come upon a hallucinogen, and the experience would be so tremendous a ingression of novelty into their ordinary experience that they would immediately cultify the source of the experience and uh, surround it with taboos and ritual and you're off and running, you know, all the elements are present. This may be true, 
my brother has wanted to go farther and suggest that uh, consciousness itself may be a kind of self-reinforcing feedback loop that has to do with hallucinogens in the environment being encountered by monkeys who then keep taking them and and you know as you experience a state you uh, sort of imprint it these creodes are laid down and this is perhaps related to what's called flashback although I'm not sure that I believe that the flashback phenomenon exists but I think it is true that you can come to think psychedelically uh, in the absence of psychedelic drugs if you have used them for years and years and years it just becomes like a style of being and I think this style of being in the earliest primates developed into what we call civilization. The style of being, of holding ideas, freely commanding images, accessing material in the past, juxtaposing things in novel situations. These may have, event, have originally been forms of mental disequilibration that were meaningless to primates. I mean, what, what is a monkey to do when suddenly a two-year-old uh, memory of a hunting situation passes through the mind in a state of disequilibrium and confusion. But of course, we can see that the major thing which has given us a leg up on all other plants and animals on the planet is that we think and we draw conclusions. And from those conclusions, we put operational procedures into effect so that any agent in the environment which would promote the generation of self-reflection would be, a, it's like a evolutionary super fuel or something. It just gives you a, a tremendous uh, advantage over every other species. Yes? How do you suggest the, this flashback syndrome that people talk about if you don't believe that it uh, is truly well, I, it's hard for me to believe, you see, that uh, in adipose tissue you could deposit enough of a drug that then four or five days later some system would cause it all to release all at once at such a level of concentration that you would have some kind of recurring mini trip. It, I would like maybe seek a not a chemical explanation, not exactly a crude chemical explanation which is that if you take the drug you might get high again in a few days but that the experience is so novel that the imprinting of it may it may have a numinous quality so that a few days later in a moment of calm or self-reflection its numinous quality would allow it to re-emerge quite startlingly in the field of consciousness that's more my idea of what a flashback must be like the notion that you would be riding a bus and suddenly realize my god I'm getting high on LSD to me that sounds uh, slightly uh, pathological but I'm not sure I all I can say is I've taken lots of drugs and if it happened to me I would be quite uh, alarmed it has the, the theory of the flashback has the assumption that the, the, the experience is caused by the drug right and then we have the experience again you think oh it's the drug again it's left in my body or whatever right uh, whereas most of us don't believe that the experience is caused by the drug. It's caused simply the drug simply releases something that's already there. So once it's been released, it could be released again, or it could be released. That's by right. Other means. And so if you flash back, it just means you're reviewing some memory. Probably, if you studied trauma cases. Uh, with an eye to this phenomenon, you would discover that people who will say have near automobile accidents or something like that, probably 10% of them within 10 days of the experience have a f go through a jittery, strong re memory, you know, a recurrent. Well, you wouldn't say that's the chemistry of the automobile accident uh, near miss resurfacing. So it may be that all upsetting, unsettling uh, experiences have the quality to recur with startling vividness sometime later. It's just a way of integrating it or something. Yeah. Um, Is it a matter of the, um, 
amount, amount of energy that's been taken up in the process of um, being conscious that's associated with the, the particular kind of experience that makes that a, a, an altered state of consciousness as opposed to regular. Would, would you want to explain it in, in those terms? That whatever is, is experienced under um, a powerful um, energy levels will be re-experienced um, at a certain or retrieved at, at, at the same level. So somehow it's classified under that sort of experience. Right. It's state bounded in a certain way is what you're saying. It's accessible only in the same situation. Perhaps an experience of the flash or I mean an explanation of the flashback thing would be that it's an effort to integrate the material. It's actually like remembering a dream just something sets it off. You say, oh right, last night I had this dream and there was this thing and now it's coming back to me. Well, that's a flashback of some sort. And, it, and I believe the orthodox psychoanalytical explanation would be that the compensatory value of the image is being integrated into ego consciousness by the... So this would be a similar situation. Material from the unconscious does have a compensatory uh, role to play if it can be integrated. Uh, so it's, it's that kind of thing. Uh, so a little bit more about shamanism as a general phenomenon. It relates, and Mersiliad again wrote a very interesting book, which very few people seem to have read, called uh, The Forge and the Crucible, which is a study of the relationship of shamanism to alchemy through relating the two figures through the figure of the smith. The smith stands between the shaman and the alchemist because the smith, the early shaman, alchemist, metallurgist, all these things came together because uh, the ability to handle hot objects is a, related to the ability to smelt and mold metal, which is related to the ability to create. This is the Hephaestos archetype for any uh, classic scholars. This is the, the notion of the artificer and it's all and the artificer in the classical traditions, the person who makes things is always assisted by demons. This is what it means to make things. Techne is the invocation of demons, not necessarily with a pejorative uh, connotation, but as these familiars which can, they make these objects for you. They bring them from the other di dimension. It's as though they are the minions from the realm of the ideas. And the smith, shaman, alchemist working with the fire which is seen as the interface between this world and a higher world of, of, uh, of order, brings these things through. And this bringing through of magical objects and magical information was what the early shaman smith was about. Then very early these two things divided, possibly because the making of metal became associated with the shedding of blood because it came to mean not the forging of, uh, uh, of implements for agriculture, but the forging of blades uh, for slaughter. And at that point, these things were divided because there is worldwide the sense that the shaman must be kept from the mundane. The shaman rarely, in, in war-making societies, the shaman rarely makes war. He's kept back. He has a sacral quality that keeps that from happening. But it would be involved in example, helping the food gathering and hunting processes. That's right. Uh, and casting of, of magic and battle uh, prognostication and all of this. You can see the enemy coming. Looking then at narcotic sham shamanic complexes worldwide, maybe the simplest thing to do would be to survey them briefly and then to talk about the ones that are of particular interest. Uh, starting in the European and Eurasian Arctic, we have, as I mentioned before, this Amanita Muscaria cult which is a very interesting cult to me because it, ha it relates to a mushroom and uh, 
mushrooms have a role to play that has not yet been fully explicated, even though people like Gordon Wasson and John Allegro and many people have tried to bring it out. But the mushroom shamanic complex appears in two forms in the world. In the Amanita muscaria complex of the uh, Siberian and European Arctic, uh, which is a difficult one. One of the things that's puzzled anthropologists is uh, how hard it is to get high on, it, on Amanita muscaria. And, you know, people have published compendious books arguing that it was the original soma and then had to admit that when they took it, it was either inactive or very unpleasant. And so there have been suggestions that perhaps it was prepared in some way, perhaps decarboxylated. Uh, the muscarine, which is a poison, can be decarboxylated to muscamole, which is the hallucinogen, through being exposed to milk curds. And in the Vedas there is a lot of allusions to churning and to, it, it is treated somehow, it's churned with milk and extracted. So perhaps this is the, the way to do it. Other people claim that the mushrooms have to be roasted, toasted, and that somehow then it's pyrolyzed and tryptamines pyrolyzed on the surface of the skin then become active. I've taken Amanita muscaria a couple of times and found it to be uh, to range from ho-hum to fairly disturbing with not too much psychedelic activity. It, the time that I had the most extreme effects, I, I took it alone in uh, some woods behind Berkeley and uh, about an hour into it the only effect I could see I'm wearing contact lenses by the way the only effect I could see was that my vision was blurring and blurring and blurring and blurring and I made this calculation about whether I could walk out before I would be completely non-ambulatory and uh, I, I did walk out and it seemed to reach a plateau of this blurred vision thing. And then I laid down on the ground and closed my eyes and there was some sub-threshold hypnagogia, but it was definitely the small potatoes of hallucinogenesis. Now perhaps more would have been uh, more effective, but these uh, muscarining, that's a symptom of muscarine poisoning is the blurred vision. So I knew, you know, I was uh, out into it. It seems that it's highly variable geographically and seasonally uh, so that and this we'll find in talking about many of these drugs is a problem that knowing how to choose, it isn't often only a matter of the plant, but the plant, the time of year, sometimes the time of day, the growth stage of the plant, uh, the variability, signs which account for the variability, and so on. Uh, Continuing to look at the Eurasian landmass, here it is, the largest continental landmass existing in the world today, and it's been throughout uh, man's sojourn in the environment, extremely poor in hallucinogens. We could almost say that hallucinogens are absent because you have to really do some concocting to get one together in Europe. Uh, European magic, witchcraft so-called, uh, was largely based on solanaceous plants which contain tropanes, which are psychoactive definitely, but debatably hallucinogenic. They are extreme, they are confusatory and uh, extremely unpredictable and very unpleasant. Any of you who've graduated through the Carlos Castaneda books know the respect that was paid to these solanaceous plants, especially in the first book. Uh, they are not, I think, an acceptable hallucinogen for someone seeking self-transformation and understanding. They seem to be spooky tied up on some lower bardo with the projection and manipulation of other people. I've seen people get into very weird places with it. I had a friend once uh, when I was studying Tibetan in Nepal. I lived in a Nepali village and there were acres 
of Detora metalloides, the conspecific species in Asia to metal in the southwest. And uh, he got quite into it. And one day uh, I was shopping for vegetables in the market and I met him and we were talking and he said, uh, perhaps later I'll see you in the market. And I said, we're in the market. And he said, no, we're not. I'm lying down on my bed. We're talking in my apartment. And I realized, you know, this was a severe case of body image dislocation from the <laughs> linguistic center. And it was typical. Uh, I took it uh, a couple of times and found it very strange. It, the psychological part, which was quite interesting, was you would wait and slowly form the opinion that it was not working. And as long as you kept your attention focused on it, watching for its approach, it would not boil. But no one can do that for very long. Eventually you begin to think, well, should I go get something to eat or well, what's happening? And when your attention would shift, you would fall into like a twilight sleep. And what I saw happening was these things, which were ectoplasmic forms, is the only way I can describe them, came into my window and they were carrying spread sheets like newspapers. And, and these sheets of newspaper would drift down across my lap and I would read something which would be so amazing that it would jerk me out of the state. And then I would say, oh, what, what was that? Something, um, what was it? I can't remember. It was something. And then, I, and then it would begin to happen again. And this intensified. And this is typical of European witchcraft. They always say that the devil, sorry to say, will come and show you an open book. You will read from an open book. And this is, I was definitely getting this. But then, about 40 minutes after that, uh, these things began happening where I would feel the undeniable urge to tie myself in knots, to throw my arm behind my head and my leg over my shoulder, these very tight things and which would happen very quickly. And then I would find myself in this situation and very consciously unfold myself and lay back down in my mosquito net and just say, and this happened maybe a dozen times. It was, uh, it, to me, it felt like a sub convulsion of some sort. I mean, it was very, and I thought to myself at the time, you know, I'm very glad this is happening to me because I think this would try somebody else's patience to the <laughs> uttermost and it's trying mine. So I think this is the kind of thing that Detura is about. It's very unpredictable, very much about your own physiology, it varies from species to species, and there are n maybe several dozen worldwide of these highly effective solanaceous plants. You're probably all familiar with Jimson weed, Detura um, um, stramonium, which formed the basis of a shamanic religion in Southern California before the conquest, the so-called Tolach religion. Uh, of the southern, the Luis Seno Indians of Southern California and on Santa Catalina there have been uh, digs that exposed hundreds of these capsules in human graves, these uh, seed capsules of the Datura. And definitely the Nepali sadhus were using uh, this and in Benares I would occasionally notice in the gutter a cracked pod of this, so it was a, an item of commerce. It was happening. Uh, it, it, the atropine tropane complex can be balanced using other compounds that occur in European plants. So I think European shamanism, European magic, always had this quality of darkness about it because the plants available were so hard to control and the um, expulsive quality of, uh, of some of these solanaceous compounds caused them to have a role in midwifery, which gives the feminine cast to the shamanism of, of Europe. 
and, and really makes it a kind of a unique case. The only exception to what I've been saying uh, in academic uh, understanding of the role of hallucinogens in European history is the Eleusinian mysteries. And probably you're familiar with uh, Albert Hoffman, Karl Ruck, uh, and Gordon Wasson wrote a book called The Road to Eleusis, in which they argue very, very convincingly that the Eleusinian mystery, which was practiced for over 2,000 years at a cult site south of Athens, was in fact an ergot intoxication, that sacred fields of rye maintained there were infected with a uh, chance, a, a strain of Claviceps purpura, which is the smut of rye, uh, that had uh, fortuitously a very high psychedelic alkaloid content and a very low poison content, and a, a beer, essentially a cont an ergot contaminated beer was being prepared and administered. And something, I think I was very skeptical when I read the book, and it convinced me completely. I just don't think there's any doubt about it, which really is big news, because it means that our roots, our Grecian roots, go right back to a civilization that had as its centerpiece the psychedelic experience. Uh, Joe Fontenrose at Berkeley has studied the Delphic oracles, and though there's less evidence there for a cult of hallucinogen taking, it's fairly clear that the, the Pythia herself, the prophetess of the cult, was intoxicated on some kind of narcotic. Uh, moving slightly south and far deeper into speculation. You come to John Allegro's ideas about early Christianity and its uh, relation to a mushroom. Uh, his book, The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross, is, uh, makes the case that uh, there never was a person named Jesus Christ, that the entire gospel story is a set of very carefully worded religio-political documents that were drafted around A.D. 70 to uh, hide a cult of mushroom takers. And what they did is they named their sacrament after an imaginary religious reformer who had lived a generation earlier, who was Christ. And uh, I don't think that Allegro's case is nearly as convincing, but uh, his labor of collecting mushroom words in the Old Testament and of showing mushroom cognates from uh, Akkadian and Sumerian and uh, Attic Greek, it's, it represents a tremendous resource for someone else, I think, to take and construct into a tighter case. Yeah. What about the use of carmelin compounds through uh, the Middle East, North Africa, and Spain? Well, this is, an e this is even more speculative than uh, Allegro, because so far as I know, no authority or even presumed authority has ever gone into print to say that it was possible because there is no evidence of current use. But you're right. Actually, there's a lot of evidence of current use in Persia. You go to any Sufi house and they have usually two or three pounds of Syrian roof seeds and rooms laying around. And what do they do with them? Uh, very interesting things. Well, I know in Pakistan it's used, it's used basically as a room fumigant. And it, that, it has these Ayurvedic uh, uses. It's very suggestive. I mean, I think, you see, that, that we're at the beginning of this kind of ethnobotanical archaeology and that you're very probably right. Syrian rue, for those of you who don't know it, the plant this gentleman mentioned, Pergamon harmala, is the giant Syrian rue, and it occurs from Morocco, uh, basically now probably as far east as Calcutta. And uh, it contains harmine, which is the, alka the same alkaloid which is present in the ayahuasca 
the major constituent of ayahuasca, which is Banisteriopsis capi. For years, the constituent of Banisteriopsis capi was given exotic names like telepathine, banesterine, this and that, until it was finally realized that it was identical to a compound isolated in 1937 by Hochstein and Paradis that was called harmine. Uh, now, several things about this. It, in South America, the drugs that utilize harmine always do so in combination with another plant which contains DMT. Reports of the activity of harmine on its own are greatly exaggerated. In fact, if you go into the literature, what you discover is it comes down to Claudio Naranjo and one patient, and they described a, an altered state. It wasn't clear. It was clear that it was psychoactive, but it's not clear that it was hallucinogenic. It seemed to be a kind of enhanced alertness phenomenon. However, this doesn't mean that there couldn't have been a drug prepared in Eurasia that was analogous to ayahuasca in South America. What we have to do is find a DMT plant a, trip, uh, a DMT containing plant that could be combined with the Pergamon harmala to yield a strong hallucinogen. Now, the, the candidate to, that I favor is uh, Arundo Donax, which is the giant river reed of Asia. Its roots contain DMT in substantial amounts. I have never had the two plants together so that we could actually brew some up and try it. But looking at the published data of the relative concentrations, it looks to me like you should be able to brew a rip-roaring hallucinogen with a rundodonex and, and pergamon harmala. Now, um, it's very suggestive, too, because to this day, this plant, Arundodonax in the, in the uh, Arundanaceae, is uh, the preferred source for reeds for musical instruments. All fine reeds are made from Arundodonax. And uh, this suggests a mythological connection. Orpheus, the power of music, the descent into the underworld via the reed. It may be an, es an exoteric symbol of the use of the roots of the reed as a hallucinogen. So, and one last clue, which is among archaeologists, even old-styled archaeologists who know nothing of what I've just said, Pergamon harmala is commonly known as ruin weed. And when you go to Turkey and Anatolia and you're mound hopping, what you look for are, out, are patches of Pergamon harmala. It is always found coincident to these mounds that dot Anatolia, southern Turkey, Syria. There's a couple of other things that you might want to consider. Uh, that particular read, uh, if you read Sufi literature for the last 600 years, uh, it's a major metaphor for their state of consciousness. Uh, in Rumi's Masnavi uh, and his Tabani Shams, he is constantly going back to the, the reading, the sound of the read. Uh, There's a career to be made revealing the existence of this Pergamon Harmala plus read narcotic. It's very old. I'm convinced that it's real. There are even other plants that, uh, there is even a, an, a species of Banisteriopsis, Banisteriopsis argregentum, that, uh, that has DMT in it according to the one Indian chemist who analyzed it and reported it. Now this one Indian chemist has been known to make mistakes, but he did publish data indicating that this Banisteriopsis native to southern India had DMT in it. So this would be a very fertile, uh, fertile problem to take up. There are many fertile problems as we go through these two days. Again and again, I hope to be able to say, now here's a problem where someone could make a career by just leaning into this and finding out what is going on. The role of the reed in Egyptian mythology, in Sumerian mythology, uh, in uh, the the several cults that have arisen in the uh, marshes at the mouth of the Tigris-Euphrates drainage. The reed seems to me a very uh, potent, uh, potent
potential for an undiscovered hallucinogen. Uh, moving south now into Africa, uh, what we find is, as I mentioned earlier, that Africa is the most heavily impacted, human impacted environment on the planet. Species poor, consequently hallucinogen poor, but tantalizing hints exist that when, when humanity arose in Africa, it was much wetter and there was a much, more, a much wider distribution of plant species, some of which were utilizable. There is one outstanding narcotic complex, uh, hallucinogenic complex in Africa that should be mentioned, and that is uh, the Iboga cults of Gabon and Cameroon. This is Tabernatha Iboga, the source of Ibogaine. And it is uh, a, a powerful hallucinogen by repute and molecularly somewhat different from the others in the family. It hasn't been well studied because uh, it's pretty much the prerogative of men's societies with fairly stringent initiation procedures. What we need is a, a black French-speaking male anthropologist who is willing to go to Cameroon and live into this thing and find out all about it. The only other plants in Africa that show any promise at all as hallucinogens occur further south in what is now South Africa there is among the Hottentots a plant called Gawagdoad. It's uh, Pelospelos nelli, and you occasionally see them sold at nurseries around here. If you know what lithops are, or Mesembryanthemaceae, the so called stone plants, those are all plants which evolved in the deserts of southern Africa. And this one, Pelospelos bolosai, and the conspecific species Pelospelos nelli, both contain uh, uh, mesembryne, a compound unknown except from the Mesembryanthemaceae, which is a very recently evolved plant group. And uh, Hottentots swear by it. So far as I know, nobody else has ever uh, bellied up to the bar. But that's there to be done, although the political problems of working with black people in South Africa. The, yeah, caught, well, I don't know, once we, if we allow in caffeine, we lengthen our list incredibly. Caught is a super caffeine plant to, that totally obsesses the people of South Yemen and can't even be sold a uh, hundred yards across the border where people regard them as mad. No, actually, it has a fairly wide distribution. It's used in Djibouti and uh, along the coast of Aden, a, a super caffeine plant. The other plant that I will mention now, although I could have mentioned it in talking about Eurasia, is cannabis. Uh, cannabis is in an odd place because I think experientially it is a psychedelic and that would make it the world's most popular psychedelic. Chemically it is not an alkaloid, it's a polyhydric alcohol. It arose uh, in Central Asia and has been under human cultivation probably for seven to 10,000 years would be a conservative estimate. And many races have uh, evolved. Uh, some are fiber races, some are resin races. And uh, I think we tend to devalue the power of cannabis because we rarely eat it in large amounts. And I think if you'll look back through the literature of the 19th century, on cannabis. For instance, the accounts of uh, Baudelaire or the accounts of uh, uh, Bayard Taylor or uh, Fitzhugh Ludlow, you will see that eating four grams of fine Moroccan hashish uh, washed down probably with a little absinthe is quite uh, an experience and the literary record that is left of it uh, <laughs> the literary accounts that we have make it sound pretty indistinguishable from 500 micrograms of LSD although what they would have thought of 500 micrograms of LSD I don't know high-tech and pre-literate people, the people of the Choco in Colombia, smoke weed, huge bombers, and, uh, and also these uh, Hottentot people 
and and uh, well the history of cannabis use worldwide is fairly well understood the way it relates to rastafarianism the way it relates to tantric or shaivite uh, hinduism it's a big surprise, I think, to people who study yoga in this country to arrive in India and discover that most yogins in India spend many hours a day making and then consuming chillums and that this seems to be a major preoccupation of uh, everybody on the spiritual quest. Um, Excuse me. Yes. What are chillums? A chillums? A chillum is a thing which looks like a cone with the end cut off and it has a little you put a little rock in it to block it and then you mix hashish and uh, tobacco together and you pack it in and then you have a little piece of cotton cloth which is wet called a sufi I don't know if there's anything to be drawn from that or not but you wrap the sufi across the bottom of the cloth then you hold it like this or various ways and you can get an enormous suction on that and when they light it it's a burning surface about the size of a quarter and you can get a staggering hit off of it i will never forget uh, the first time i encountered it i encountered it in its most extreme form which is i had arrived uh, in israel of all places and it was not where i wanted to be i was trying to get to africa and i thought I would take a bus to southern Israel to a lot this was in 1967 and take a boat to Kenya and uh, when I got to I took this bus to this place and stopped somewhere and there was it was nothing and I went up into the desert and there were freaks Danish Dutch, Colombian, American freaks living in this dry arroyo called the Wadi, which was a place where when it rained, it washed down to the Red Sea. But since it hadn't rained for 40 years, people were living in caves in the side of this Wadi. And their technique, which I don't think I've ever seen surpassed as a smoking technique, was they would take an orange Fanta bottle and smash it on a rock so you could so you get this neck with the broken bottle then there was a one the lowest denomination Israeli coin is called an agarot and it has a it's like a gear it actually has a scalloped edge so the one agarot piece will fall into the neck of the broken coke bottle and perfectly block it and you can make a chillum which is, you know, will do, will destroy a tent full of 30 people. <laughs> and this is modern ethnopharmacology. Once, I mean, I know there are urban anthropologists among us, so these are the things which need to be documented. <laughs> anyway, it was thought. Uh, That's usually a combination of cannabis and tobacco. Then. And tobacco, almost which always. In itself is a whole other. Yes, an MAO inhibitor and uh, and all these things. The, the tobacco is the MAO inhibitor? It is a strong yeah. MAO inhibitor, yeah. What's MAO? Uh, monoamine oxidase. This is the system in your brain which uh, is inhibiting uh, uh, monoamines, meaning serotonin is a monoamine, but so are all these drugs. So if you if you take a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, the monoamines no longer oxidize, and oxidation is their way of being inactivated. So if you take an MAO inhibitor and then one of these drugs, it doesn't go away. It just goes on and on and on and on until your monoamine oxidase system reasserts itself and quenches the drug effect. And there are powerful monoamine oxidase inhibitors. There are monoamine oxidase inhibitors which will inhibit every molecule of monoamine oxidase in your entire body to the point where it takes 23 days to build back up to normal MAO levels. Most MAO inhibitors are not so violent. For instance, harmine is a what's called a reversible MAO inhibitor. It inhibits MAO for four to six hours and then is uh, degraded uh, by that pathway. Um, 
continuing on around the world looking at these shamanic hallucinogenic drug complexes I mentioned Soma in India, probably Amanita muscaria in the opinion of Gordon Wasson. I think that it's more likely that it was a Strafaria. And I will talk about the mushrooms when I get to, South, to Latin America, to Central America. But it's important to remember that their point of origin is believed actually to be Southeast Asia, to be, in fact, Cambodia. Uh, and they seem to have a, a very old symbiotic relationship with the white cattle, the Cebu, the tropical cattle, which developed in that same area. At Non Nok Tha in northern Thailand, they have found graves, Neolithic graves, 15,000 BP, with the bones of Boss Indicus intermingled with human bones in human burials, and with some of the bones of Boss Indicus with burned out centers indicating a chillum, the use of it as a chillum. Obviously bones were the first chillums. Uh, but no mushroom use is known to survive in Asia, although in the interests of completeness there is a curious situation going on in in what used to be called New Guinea, which is now West Irian in Indonesia, there is a, uh, it was very puzzling. There were tribes high up in this mountain valley who took mushrooms. And when they took the mushrooms, they behaved as though they were possessed. And uh, it looked to people as the reports began to filter out, aha, another mushroom cult. And Gordon Wasson and his people went and made extensive collections. And the problem was that the mushrooms, a number of species were indicated in this folk way. And none of them had any uh, discernible psychoactivity at all. And no chemical analysis showed anything happening. So then they went back through it much more carefully with linguists. And what this means, they went through it much more carefully with linguists is they asked the people. <laughs> said, Why do you do this? These mushrooms that don't do anything. And they said, oh, we know they don't do anything, but you can't, uh, you can't run amok unless you've taken them. <laughs> and it turned out it was a, a cultural permission thing. It was that the expression of extreme dissatisfaction and rage was to be always preceded by the ingesting of certain mushrooms. And no one knew why. And it may be a, a memory of a mushroom cult, or it may be totally unrelated to the normal acquisition of vision states uh, from drugs. Who can say? other mushrooms in Nepal and like there's a lot of them there now. Well, there are, once, uh, once psilocybin was located and noticed as a metabolite of, uh, of uh, Basidiomycetes, then they began looking worldwide and they find them everywhere. It's called synchronicity and it's just called a necessary, because the world exists, this must happen, so this exists. But what, hap what are you to say when it happens 20 times an hour? <laughs> What seems to be happening, and what would certainly challenge science tremendously, is that under certain conditions, mind can become a force in the environment through the intercession of drugs. Now, at first, this idea may sound outlandish. Then at second pass, it sounds pedestrian. It sounds like it's just a, a new way of describing magic. You're saying what magic is, is mind as force in the world. I think that's true, but what interests me is what are the limitations of this and how can one take control of it? The ego does not seem to be the controller of the force. The force, the controller behind the buildup of coincidence is not the ego, but it is like the ego. Perhaps it's the superego. Whatever it is, it has some kind of overview of events and it can move the situation in different directions. So when you take the drugs, uh, this is why I said earlier this morning, I sit still in darkness because I don't want to send waves out into the world that can be returned to me as affects. 
because it just becomes too strange. You know, you discover that the world really is made of language. And if you discover this too fast, it will undo you because you're part of the world and you don't want to discover that you are also only made of language and then draw the appropriate conclusions from that and then, you know, where would you be left? So you have to proceed carefully with the project of deconstruction as to what the, the psychedelic state is in itself, if we can speak of an in itself and a for itself of the psychedelic experience, it seems to me that it must be, it's a dimension. It's a higher, uh, dimensions are very hard to talk about, mm -hmm. but it's some kind of higher enfolding of space which you occupy. This morning I made the metaphor of that it stands the shaman in eternity. This is a way of saying that there is a dimension which encompasses all time, but which stands behind it, but which can somehow be entered via the drug. The reason I think this is true is because I think you can look at all of evolution as a conquest of dimensions. This is what is actually happening. Like the earliest forms of life, had only a tactile sense. They got no information about the world except about those objects that were in direct contact with their surface, and then they encountered them as resistance. That was the, the readout these primitive organisms got. Well, then they developed uh, photoactive spots on their bodies so that they could register electromagnetic input from a higher dimension photons falling on the environment, previously a datum unavailable to biology, suddenly became available. And the a difference was established between light and darkness, and animals could move toward the light or you know, into darkness, so this sort of thing. Then that sets the, those uh, photoactive patches that convey the impression of light and darkness, set the stage for the development of the eye but, and the eye presupposes a real conquest of distance because you're actually coordinating information that is not immediately present. What it is, if you analyze it very carefully, is it's ahead of you in time. When you look with your eyes at something, what you are doing operationally is looking into the future because you are going to then set your legs in motion and walk toward the thing seen and confirm for yourself its existence. And time is passing while you are walking toward this object. You are walking toward the thing beheld a moment before. So you see, your eyes are further ahead of you in time than any other sense. And uh, with bipedal motion, and binocular vision, we're getting ever finer and finer coordination of three-dimensional space. And we know the primates have the best coordination of three-dimensional space of any animal group, and they achieved it by leaping from tree to tree and swinging from limb to limb and achieving this marvelous uh, uh, coordination within a three-dimensional axis. The leap to the next dimension, which is not a spatial dimension, but a temporal dimension, occurs through a development of an entirely different set of, um, of mechanisms. We're no longer now talking about coordinating mm. bipedal motion with the eyes. We're talking about keeping the past present somehow so that it doesn't go away and finding out about the future and having it also in the present somehow. And for this you need language and, uh, and uh, uh, grammars with tenses. And so this whole quasi-biological mechanism is developed which allows a further conquest now of time. Now we no longer live in a kind of a shimmering eternal present, but we have a history and a geological history, a planetary history, a meta history. We have a future and a planetary future and a meta future. And we squeeze all this down. We say, we know where we are. We're halfway from the Big Bang to God and we're well coordinated. Now, 
what is happening is with the hallucinogens yet it turns out there is yet another level of ingression into the mix of being a previously entirely unanticipated level as unanticipated as a, le a level as history was unanticipated by the creature with the light sensitive spot it was a great task for it to conceive of light and darkness let alone the notion of a universal cosmic history and what the hallucinogen and, and this is why recall that I said that uh, the tryptamines are so much like brain chemistry and the beta carbolines as well which are the compounds in ayahuasca which inhibits the MAO they occur in the living brain in fact the compounds in ayahuasca and the compounds in the living human brain are so close as to be essentially co-mappable what this means to me is that actually without the presence of psychedelics uh, per se we are evolving into this dimension that I'm talking about that is the dimension beyond history beyond three-dimensional space in fact this is what religion is this is what ecstatic uh, ecstatic experience is these are uh, anticipations of a future state of humanity that we are moving toward it's uh, who was it Wordsworth Keats somebody wrote uh, in Ode to a Grecian Urn, intimations of immortality. That's what it is. It's an intim a growing intimation of immortality. If by immortality we mean this strange, all-inclusive, previously invisible dimension of information which the psychedelics are making accessible. And I think that, you know, we have come to a funny place in this process, a place where a person like me and people like you can sit in a room and I actually articulate the process. I say this is what's happening, but you see, it's always been happening. History is the clue to the fact that the monkeys are undergoing some kind of rollover and it takes 10 or 15,000 years for the rollover to occur and we're, you know, three quarters of the way through it. So by this time, things are very strange. Everything is up for grabs. What's normal is not normal. What's secure is not secure. But uh, the psychedelics anticipate this, um, this future state. Now, what is it and why should it lie further along the evolutionary pathway? I think the answer to that is that um, as an animal evolves the pressure is on filtering information so that the important information gets to the brain centers that need that information to keep the organism alive so the filters which are evolved in the evolutionary process lay a tremendous stress on immediacy you know quickness of response how fast can you detect the attacking object how fast can you perceive uh, pain heat uh, all of these things so consequently as an animal evolves there is a um, maximizing of data about the immediate space and a minimizing of data about ever more removed points in space. I mean, an, a monkey evolving on the planet Earth needs no information about the galactic center. So if evolution proceeds by some kind of process of economy, all information about the galactic center will be winnowed out. It isn't necessary. Nevertheless, there seems to be in the physics of being this idea that all information is co-present everywhere it's just that it is if it doesn't have biological efficacy or confer some advantage it's not going to be uh, easily accessed but strangely as a species or a culture evolves the information that comes that qualifies for uh, uh, efficacy changes 
so that now we are a historical society or we're not a troop of primates moving through the treetops we're a high-tech society with a, a deep knowledge of our history and a, an intense anticipation of our future so we uh, we exemplify this process we see it happening in ourselves and we have use now suddenly for this information in these previously hidden realms and this is why we are gaining information about more and more abstract areas we know now about the center of the atom about uh, what the processes that operate on the surfaces of stars and what's going on in black holes all this we have deduced but we also have it in our heads in a way and uh, as the culture, e cultural economy changes in relationship to information, this information will be revealed and used. And shaman are simply like uh, uh, leaders. They're just going first. They're explorers. They live where we all will live. And they always have done that. I think they've always been ahead of everyone. And uh, But it's this passing into a higher dimension is a very strange thing because it's going to be imperceptible yet it's the major change in our lives it's an internalized change we are not all living in the same historical moment you know some of us are living in the early 90s some of us probably in the mid 60s I mean people cling to preferred points in the historical continuum but this psychedelicizing of the self, this ability to hold an image of eternity in your mind, waking or sleeping, this ability to hold an image of the planet in space, the history of the species, the correct relation of everything in the cosmos, that's what this higher sense is. And it, uh, it's causing history and will obviate history. And that's why it's very important. And that's why the hallucinogens are so controversial and fraught with, uh, you know, energy of different sorts for different people because they are actually the thing which made us human and they are the thing which is going to make us more than human. And they are part of a flowing stream. They don't, uh, they're not tolerant of stasis so to the degree that anyone forms an attachment to some static co uh, situation or concept the psychedelics will will abrade that and dissolve it unwind the pattern and take it away how you can uh, what you're talking about uh, in the beginning or this morning you said that you made a reference that your life is a certain way now and you like it that way <coughs> How the, I don't know what that means to you, but right away I went into what that might mean for me. I know I, I know you're married and you have children, and, and how does that, how does this stasis that you're talking about and and the hallucinogenics, how do they relate? How do they live with one another? I shouldn't say stasis as as, as one way. No, but living. it's a very the good question. <laughs> Well, it's, I think it's uh, always been said that, it, that the path is a razor's edge, you know, that you can fall too far to one side or the other. And the, the trick is to know what you're do, getting into so that you make your choices with open eyes. I have contacted, you know, these states of being which are like siren songs. You just say, you know, my God, this is so impelling that I want to always be like this. I don't, uh, and some of them are titanic. Like, for instance, one of the odd things in the Amazon when you take mushrooms that at first I thought was delightful, and then I actually came to see it as actually a weird kind of danger so that it always made me a little uncomfortable, is you're sitting stoned on mushrooms, and this idea gets hold about how you had previously misperceived the jungle and actually the jungle is the natural home of man and the jungle is the mother and you begin to get a picture 
in your head of a way you could be that would fulfill you but not be human. It would be life in the canopies. It would be the life of a psychedelic super ape, you know? If the evolutionary thing had turned another way and we had developed philosophy the way we developed science, then we would move in troops through the trees in contemplation of the absolute outside of history. History could never, need never have happened. And you know, you're just thinking away on this, and saying, yes, it sounds pretty good, uh huh, mm hmm, mm hmm. And what are the conclusions to be drawn? And they are, you know, that you, you are choosing to sit here doing this. You're choosing to play botanist, ethnopharmacologist, American citizen, father, lover. You're choosing to do all this it's okay to choose to do it but you are choosing to do it it is not a fate you aren't set into it you could just right now just get up quietly and walk toward the green and keep moving now <clears throat> what would happen to you if you did that the orthodoxy says uh, night would fall the uh, the Moscow's would gather and you would die within hours, if not days, of madness induced by insect bites, if not being chewed on by some large animal. <laughs> but the state says no. It says, you know, as you're leaving behind your humanness, you're leaving behind all these assumptions. You know it doesn't work like that. You know that the cutting edge of being is will, and it is going to be the way you will it to be. And uh, I've never tested the limit of this thing, but I, I have seen briefly people do things where they willed it the way it was to be, and it bordered, you know, on the uncanny. And this is what the, the, the feats of super balancing that are in uh, Carlos Castaneda, tricks on waterfalls and that kind of thing. This is where you say, you know what I can do? I can do almost anything I want to do and then proceed to go out on the razor's edge and perform these things. And they challenge, you know, the ontological definition of humanness. The thing that we were investigating when we went to the Amazon challenges the ontological definition of humanness. What we were looking for, we had heard reports that in very off-the-river situations in these very unacculturated tribes that uh, people, shaman taking ayahuasca, vomited an exotic material that uh, was uh, some, somehow, it was like uh, a part of their body. It was a, a regurgitatable magical organ of some sort that they then looked into this stuff and could see it was their means of divining. It was how they found lost objects, how they saw the future, how they performed all their magic was by means of a psycho-physical fluid generated inside their own body. Well, this is either, you know, big news or absolute madness. There's very little room to maneuver with a notion like that. But then, you know, you, you get out there in the jungle and it all begins to dissolve because uh, language binds us the way atomic forces bind metallic atoms in a matrix. We all believe the same thing because there are thousands and thousands of us here all packed closely together, all more or less believing the same thing. If you go off into isolation, you're like, a, you're like an electron moving out of a metallic matrix. Suddenly you're no longer bound by the rules that govern the mass phenomena of uh, metallic uh, atoms. Suddenly you're subject to a new set of laws and you discover reality is very malleable and, uh, and can change right in front of you. And then with the addition of psychedelics, you discover, you know, that language is the leading edge and that it can be projected into the world. Then the trick is to learn, you know, how to do this without becoming unbalanced, how to do it without hurting other people, and finally how to do it and actually help people. 
but it's a strange notion and it's been tugging at the human experience probably since before history probably for the past 20 or 30,000 years there has been you know this in the peripheral vision of the collectivity of the species the awareness that mind is a very funny thing and that put through the mill with psychedelic drugs very interesting things can happen the the user of these psychedelic plants he lives in his world has much greater reality for him than the world of modern physics has for the people who practice modern physics because it's an experiential world and uh, and yet we dismiss it entirely you know as a, a kind of a psychologism a kind of delusion but it's because we are so certain that language secures the bound the ground of being this reminds me of um, um, what I'm mostly interested in um, you mentioned um, those imprints um, uh, the fact that the um, the plants have helped the apes gain a new dimension of consciousness and probably um, doing it a little faster than they would have probably done it. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Sean Gepser's um, five stages of development of consciousness. Um, I'm, I'm not so much into that. I've become lately interested. I only know of the five stages. They're the archaic into magic, into mythic, into mental, and into transcendental uh, consciousness. And, and the idea of the transcendental consciousness being the new consciousness that could have happened to a certain individual sometime way past in the history or someone in the future, but it happens gradually to everybody that the whole um, uh, race is going through these uh, stages of, of transformation. His idea was that um, they happen um, in the form of uh, mutations in consciousness, which probably can find correspondences in when you get into the the the, uh, the genetics of it. But um, I was wondering if you could elaborate on that, so that at least um, this was uh, pretty much of a new insight to me. Uh, I thought that it would happen only naturally as a as a result of genetic mutation that you begin to tap maybe not higher but different levels of consciousness well no i don't think so see um the human animal hasn't changed very much in fifty thousand years what seems to be happening is once you have culture then change is transferred out of the genetic realm and into what's called the epigenetic realm and so though the human animal has changed suddenly culture is mutating very very rapidly in fact just furiously shedding new forms I'm not familiar with the person you mentioned but I know a, a theory which sounds like it sort of parallels this is Julian Jaynes theory that he puts forth in his book the origin of consciousness in the bicameral mind and what he says there is very interesting he says that up until fairly recently up until maybe Homeric times, circa 1400 BC, uh, everyone heard voices. And that, in fact, people were sort of like animals, except that when they reached a decision point, they would appeal to God, and God would tell them what to do. And it wasn't always God, sometimes it was the king, sometimes it was the dead king. But anyone, anyway, everybody had in their head a button they could push marked, uh, give me the answer to the question posed. And, uh, he, and he deduces this by studying certain passages in the Iliad and other things like that. But then he says, uh, this phenomenon could only exist in a situation where civilizations were not in contact with each other because traders going from one city-state to another from Ur to Chaldea we'll say would s notice the fact that in Ur everybody heard the king's voice in their head mm -hmm. in Chaldea everybody heard the god something or other in their head mm -hmm. and so these early merchants 
realize the relativity of religion and, and uh, essentially invented the ego. They discovered that the voice which was giving people directions could become the self in some that it, what had previously spoken from above could actually be integrated and become the self. Well, we now all are like this. We have all passed through this cultural transition. None of us, I hope, but too much, <laughs> hear voices which give us directions. We don't do that. We ask what we call our conscience, our self. It's always accessible, and in fact, we call it me say let, let me see what I think we don't say let me see what the king thinks the king has become us this previously autonomous psychic function has been claimed for consciousness well how many of these ascents are possible how many of these godlike hidden sources of information through a process of slow historical transformation can become so familiar that they become indistinguishable from me and I then identify so what James is saying about Homeric man is that Homeric man became Homeric God and and actually bootstrapped himself to his ideal uh, this same sort of thing may be happening with the confluence of uh, psychedelics and cybernetics in other words a God is evolving on this planet. It's a cybernetic god. And Julian James, he talks about this. He makes a very interesting case. He says, in Chaldea, people believing that when they had a question, they needed to listen to the voice of the king in their head is not greatly different than millions and millions and millions of people having their consumer choices, the clothes they wear, the food they eat, the churches they attend, dictated to them by mass media. Taking mass media seriously is like being demonically possessed by some kind of collective uh, organism. So, uh, but I'm more optimistic than that, see. I think that the mass media is a very transitory phase of the cybernetic revolution, and that what is actually happening is that a, an overmind is coming into being, which is a human collectivity, and it is a, 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 a in a holographic sense that all these little parts are merging into the that all the information is beginning to flow. All the information is accessible at any point in the matrix. That each one of us can now access the Library of Congress uh, shelf list, the New York Times data file. We are becoming universalized. A supermind is coming into being and just beginning to come into being. And we may have 50 years or so of relating to it as distinct from us. And, but obviously, very quickly, as the way we manipulate our machines becomes more natural and we're pointing our way toward the thought manipulated machine that is implanted behind your ear at birth something like that at that point uh, the the cybernetic overmind of the species becomes a function of your personality and we all begin to have this alternative hyper self where we're all together and the psychedelics you now you see describing it with cybernetics is like an, a, a nuts and bolts description of it. This is how the rational Dionysian engineering types will attack the problem. They'll want to do it with computers and surgical implants and all that. The fact of the matter is, it is happening now. It's what psychedelic people are. It's what they know. It's just that we can't articulate it. The real thing you get out of a deep psychedelic experience is you abide with the overmind in the global racial unity of the overself for a few minutes or hours. And then, taking away whatever fragmented images you can, you make your way down to what is called normal consciousness, which is the fruits of our historical experience. But people are beginning to come and go with greater and greater frequency from this new absolute that is being established and will be present for everyone ahead of us in time. 
and this it, it's like a religious um, hypostatization it's actually the condensation of the philosopher's stone as a concrescence of information which transforms the relationship of the self to the world and the psychedelics anticipate this they are not the Dionysian engineering type nuts and bolts approach they are the feminine intuitive magical natural biological organic etc a approach to it and it has always been present but it only works for the privileged few it's a professional discipline it's as though we have an aspiration well you can imagine we are in the position now that vis-a-vis uh, -vis <coughs> contact with the overmind that Ur was vis-a-vis -vis writing it's a magical thing which only certain specialists highly trained and closely tied to the priestly hierarchy can do they can write now we have people highly trained close to the ruling hierarchy who can manipulate computers but obviously eventually this will be like opening your eyes and looking around and the psychedelics anticipate that information attributed to the so-called epigenetic um, development? Is well, it, is, is it assuming that, that this... Tool evolution is what I mean by epigenetic development. In other words, the, the hands stay the same. There has been no evolution in the human hand, but what this hand makes for this hand has been changing furiously for 15,000 years. First it was this hand handing this hand stone flints, now it's this hand handing this hand space shuttles, particle accelerators, the H-bomb, and so on. You know, but the the assumption is that this epigenetic one is is a different realm of, of experience than the genetic experience. Is it? Well, is genetic it? Uh, change to an or to a straight evolutionary biologist, they say you know if there isn't gene change, there isn't genetic change, and certainly when uh, cultural change is not accompanied by identifiable shift in the genome. Uh, the, the human genome of the Mayans is the same genome basically as the Nazis or the Tang Chinese or anybody else. The genome stays the same, but culture is now the theater of transformation because mind, which previously was not present or was somehow unable to express itself, has found the way to express itself. The combination of the prehensile hand and grammar, you know, has allowed this thing to really get loose. And the evolution, see, I maintain that we can go a, a step to a more basic level than talk about culture, cultural change. Cultural change is being caused by change in language. Language is really the thing that is evolving. And that's why the more we can say, the more we can do, you know? I mean, we have these mantras of staggering power, which are simply articulations. Energy equals mass times the velocity of light squared. Before anybody said this, we lived in one kind of world. After somebody said it, we lived in another. So the evolution of language is reflected as cultural change, but we don't know what language is. We don't know whether it arises in the organism, this is the new school of Chomsky and that, or whether, you know, it descends from divinity and vouchsafes our relationship to the good Lord. We don't know what it is. I always say, you know, if you're looking at the world trying to find God's thumbprint, Language is God's thumbprint on the world. Language is a continual happening miracle, and there's no clue as to how it works. It is ab absolutely outside the realm of explanation, of, uh, and linguistics is not an explanatory science. It's a descriptive science. How does language work? How does this language relate to that language? But what in the world it could be? How small mouth noises could have risen to the status of an ontological vehicle for transforming the universe is not easy to grasp. And for sure it is that. You see, there seem to be two tendencies at work in the entire universe. A large-scale physical and chemical tendency toward entropy, 
toward the breakdown of form and the release of heat and the dissolution of everything. And for, you know, the second law of thermodynamics states this, and it's always been held to be an absolute and there's no reprieve and so on and so forth. But actually, all biological systems are anti-entropic. They are chemical states which are at equi are achieve stability far from equilibrium, and they don't drift to equilibrium. They actually maintain themselves off the main line of equilibrium. Uh, and uh, you know, the average star only lives about two billion years. Most of the stars we see in the sky are older than that, but that's because they aren't average stars. Average stars come and go rather quickly, uh, two billion years. But life, we know, has been on this single planet more than two billion years. This means that in contrast to the 19th century view of what's going on in the universe, life is not some weird parenthetical mistake or some fluke. No, no. Life is a process on the scale of star formation in terms of its ability to determine the final end state of the history of the universe. Life is evolving in the opposite direction, conserving order. It begins just as the DNA. The DNA is a molecular machine for conserving information, for conserving these nucleotide uh, sequences as codons and the, and every time there's a mutation it saves it it saves it in fact there's one evolutionary biologist should said we should view the first life form as the most perfect life form because all life subsequently have been monstrously mutated uh, uh, forms driven away from the perfect original primal form so that we could view ourselves, you know, as the greatest accumulation of recessive genes in the cosmos. That's what makes us the way we are. So, uh, I don't know. Does this touch anything for anybody? <laughs> um, seems like one major genetic change that has to do with language is the form of the human type larynx. Apparently, Neanderthal man did now. So there's a major genetic change that had to happen. Yes, and that was generated by a consciousness. It could well have been entirely accidental, and then the person with the true breeding gene for the reshaped larynx, we are uniquely uh, set up to do this to emit small mouth noises. That's what we do. I mean animals do this but a very limited repertoire but by just tiny expenditures of energy on the tongue and palate we can produce a staggering variety of sounds which we can rapidly link together uh, in an infinite number of combinations and this uh, ability allows then uh, the arbitrary assignment of meaning see I maintain that long before there was uh, m meaning, there was language. I mean, people did it to entertain each other. It's, uh, we distinguish between talking and singing, but I think before that distinction, people made small mouth noises for each other's amusement and edification around the fire at night, and probably had done this for thousands of years before someone said, hey, you know what we could do? A different game. Let's assign a sound to an object. Then when I hold up this object, you, of course they didn't say this, because you have to, but it's a dim groping and awareness. I mean, it must have burst over them with the same kind of force that the discovery of the differential calculus or Maxwell's equation, or, I mean, these are great truths, you know. Small mouth noises can stand for things and throw open a doorway that leads who knows where? So it presupposes at this point that the cognitive formation had been there before the linguistic label had come into existence, um, which kind of makes me interested um, more in the nonverbal processes of the brain that are um, least um, looked into. Like we have this verbal versus the whole array of nonverbal things, but it seems to me like there's like how the egg develops and the inside of a hen, it has all these stages and then you kill them and a hen 
again, you can see three, four different eggs at different stages, and we just see one stage to this. But, That's right. Uh, there has to be uh, pre predispositions of meaningful, uh, non-verbal uh, stuff before the label came into it. Well, like, what are we to make uh, of a phenomenon like glossolalia? Are you all familiar with what that is? Mm -hmm. Glossolalia is speaking in tongues. This is when people in a hyped up state of arousal begin to either speak an ancient language previously unknown to them, or uh, that's actually technically called xenoglossia, or they speak an unknown language, unknown to anybody, but highly emotionally charged and somehow related to their religious beliefs, which are uh, in the Christian context, usually this Pentecostalism in Protestantism or Evangelical Catholicism. But uh, what the reason I bring it up is because uh, psilocybin is a glossolalia inducer. This is one of the things it does. It causes or makes accessible glossolalia. And uh, what does that mean, you know? That a psychedelic drug uh, can trigger spontaneous vocalizations where, and there you see the meaning is archetypical somehow. The meaning, it's like a mantric language, not a dictionary language. The meaning is locked into the sound. And I think, uh, you know, people like uh, Robert Graves and other people have suggested that before history, there may have been a primary poetic language that was a language of sound so that anyone hearing it understood the meaning because the meaning was implicit. It didn't depend on a common dictionary. This may be true. I don't know. I know that when you're stoned on ayahuasca and these guys sing in Quechua and in these other forest languages, who knows what, you know, pictures form and they move at the speed of the song and they are, perhaps this is the argument against their being taken seriously, they are what you might expect, you know. <laughs> they are about the river and the people and heart and brown water and sunlight on stone and you're seeing all this while the guy is, you know, and you have a very strong sense that this is a shared thing. Mm -hmm. And many people on ayahuasca report what's, the, what's called the nature walk phenomenon, which is ayahuasca doesn't speak like psilocybin, but it shows, and what it, it's like a searchlight. It shows you things in the jungle. You're just sitting still in the dark hut, and yet it's showing you plants, and you're, you have these intuitions of what it's for. You know, and I'm sure if you took ayahuasca a lot and moved in and walked around in the jungle, you know, the speed of the reinforcement, the teaching schedule, I mean, it is teaching you, it is teaching you. Psilocybin is the same way. It's almost like a, a cassette home study course. It starts <clears throat> off where it left off each time and just carries you deeper and deeper into this thing. The elves contacted uh, by myself and other people in the DMT flash teach something about language. I'm sure you've heard me go on at great length about the translinguistic language, the language which is beheld rather than heard, something you can do with your voice to make other people see pictures instead of string meanings together. And I, you know, this is what they are toying with, a, uh, a human ability just out of reach of the majority of us, requiring discipline, chemical reinforcement, and most importantly, the, f the knowledge that such a thing is possible, you know? I mean, how would anyone ever stumble on to something like this uh, unless they had good clues? Yeah? Perhaps you could comment on a, a somewhat related phenomenon that happens with peyote. In Native American church, uh, in, in that service, that ceremony, they sing two kinds of songs. Uh, one is a song that doesn't have any words, and another is a song that has sounds interspersed with meaningful words in a native language. And it's a fairly common phenomenon, especially when you get several different tribes in a teepee together having a meeting, that if they eat enough peyote, uh, 
they'll start spontaneously translating uh, one tribe language into another. And you'll hear the song as if it was your own language. That's right. This kind of thing goes on. Well, peyote, I think, is another one of these language and information inducers. There are stories that are hard to know what to do with. I mean, Gordon Wasson tells a story. I think the second time they went to the Sierra Mazateca, he took the mushroom and he took more than he intended and uh, had this glossolalia and sang for hours and hours in an unknown language. And when he came down to Watla in the morning, People said, we heard you singing last night. We didn't know you spoke Mazatecan. You sing beautifully. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the botanist Theodor Koch Grunberg, the famous story about him when he was on the upper Putumayo, moving along the boat in a river, and the, the man he'd hired, the boatman, said, the vine calls and turned the boat into the side of the shore and got his machete and rushed into the bushes and was back in 20 minutes with a huge length of ayahuasca. And, you know, this whole thing. I had a very odd experience. Uh, in the spring of 75, I was taking, when we were working out the growing techniques, I was taking and testing a lot of batches of mushrooms. And uh, it would sing to me and uh, one particular night there was all this information and the end of every sentence it would say the word says like uh, uh, da -da 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 -da, says well then about three weeks later I was reading uh, Wasson's book The Wondrous Mushroom and uh, and he mentions that uh, in, in uh, not even Mazatecan but the other language, Mixtec. In the Mixtec hams to the mushroom, the end of every line is ended with the word D-Z-I-N, Zin, which means says. So it translates into your own language for you, you know, but it's saying the same thing, whether you're a Sierra Mazatecan shamaness or whether you're, you know, a graduate of Cal Berkeley. And this communicating thing is a total challenge. We, I don't know if we can handle it, our society, because we believe, you know, that we're the top of the pyramid and uh, disembodied voices are pathological and uh, I'm not sure how we can come to terms with it. But uh, we're now getting down to bedrock in terms of talking about all this in that this language issue and the evolution of language, the relationship of language to reality, the relationship of language to brain states, to drugs, to brain states, somewhere in this area the answer uh, will lie. And by the answer I mean an ability to enter into these states and control them and, uh, and manipulate them the way we want to. It's like an energy. I didn't used to I, it took me a long time to buy the idea that Western civilization had missed something of primary importance. Maybe of a little importance, you know, but not of primary importance. But I grow more and more convinced that uh, everything is culture-bound. Even mathematics is culture-bound, you know. Yeah. As, I get, as you talk, I get the impression that you're not talking so much as maybe as many psychologists would about how certain drugs can unlock pre-known knowledge or whatever from the brain, but rather you're talking about communication from something outside. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't buy these reductionist theories. I think, you know, I've made the metaphor that. Uh, the discovery, the great intellectual adventure, one of them, of the 20th century, has been the discovery and description of the unconscious. And it begins with Freud, who discovered that people have dirty minds, essentially. In other words, he just dropped down one level and saw that there was this whole psychomental life which nobody was talking about, but which was all tied up with how we really think and feel. And then no sooner had he gotten this fairly well laid out and working the way he wanted than his student Jung broke away from him and said, yes, that's all true, but the entire sexual complex 
has to be centered in a larger sphere which I will call the collective unconscious and which will include not simply personal traumatic material and repressed uh, wish fulfillment and all this stuff but also the traumatic material and suppressed wish fulfillment and psychic dominance of the species and this seemed like a very far out idea it meant that we were all somehow connected and that cultural patterns you see in the 19th century they always tried to trace on the ground how a, a goddess or a, a magical belief got from one place to another because they reasoned how else could it be transmitted Jung blows that all up and says well people will spontaneously event, invent the same religious forms the same rituals the same notions worldwide because that's just how people are now I think that what the the tryptamine hallucinogens hold out is a new level in defining and enunciating what the unconscious is it's that beyond the Freudian position beyond the Jungian concern with the images embedded in the species mind actually a major portion of what's called the unconscious has nothing to do with human beings and is much more like a landscape or a place than it is like repressed memories or archetypal images it simply is a place and uh, many researchers have confirmed that when you take psychedelics when they start people out on LSD the first trips are usually uh, personalistically oriented how screwed up I am I don't love the right people I don't like myself I'm not doing it all this and it's very painful for people because it is condensed psychoanalysis basically but if they will persist and many people don't they just say my god who needs this I'm worried enough as it is I don't need to dwell but if you if you persist then uh, that stops because you can only be so screwed up you know and, and you get it worked out you actually come into a place of maturity then the Jungian uh, the survey of these deeper levels of the psyche these contact with dominance seems to be what the psychedelic experience is and the dominance though are usually presented as guardians of gateways mm -hmm. almost in a Gnostic schema where the soul has to ascend through gateways to escape the machinery of fate if you persist beyond that you reach the topology that shamanism describes a place with a howling wind, a doorway onto a desolate plain, a howling wind, all these descriptions, but the main stress is geological and topological, a surface into which you go, no longer self-doubting, or you know, not at least so self-doubting that it's interfering with your functioning. And this dimension is the one that is real puzzling, because if it was puzzling to explain how the Jungian information was coded in the brain it's even more puzzling to how explain how these topologies with no apparent tangentiality to human concerns could be there and I think that what's going to have to give way to assimilate all this is the notion that the mind is something uh, causally related to the brain I don't think it is and this has been an article of faith for 200 years that eventually we would show that the activity at first chemical and finally electrical of the brain is causally related to thought I don't think it is I think that uh, that there that the hidden force in the world that all the shouting and jumping up and down but is about is mind and that it pl that the brain is a piano and the mind is Horowitz and you will never <laughs> and you will never understand Horowitz by picking apart the piano now the if the problem here is it sounds like an absolute dualism if the brain if the mind is not uh, is not uh, an electrical the the ongoing electrical functioning of the of the uh, brain what is it I think that it's the part of the human body that you can't see it's an organ 
but you know who has seen their pancreas and yet we all believe it's there well uh, but notice that there's something odd about if you think of people as objects which you're not supposed to do by the way <laughs> but if you think of them as objects for a moment you notice something very odd about them that they are a very special class of objects they change through time stones chairs buildings these things don't but the class of objects called people change through time it's almost as though taught for a person to exist there has to be an added dimension no object can live so that people are hyperdimensional objects the fact of our living proves that we're hyperdimensional objects we require the dimension of time in order to be a rock doesn't i mean a rock is fully a rock in a microsecond a person is not fully a person except in a lifetime or at least certainly a span of time longer than a microsecond so so being alive proves that there is an intersection of a higher topological manifold and that that's what biology is biology is objects which live objects which have time bounded into them in some way well then mindedness is the binding in of yet a higher dimension and uh, the brain perceives the mind but the mind is is not part of it i think it's another organ of the body the brain perceives the stomach when you say you have a stomach ache it is your mind i mean it is your brain which is processing these nerve signals and telling you this and uh, the brain is the hidden i mean the mind is the hidden organ of the human body and when you take psychedelics you see this hidden organ you exercise it you move into it and it's a very strange organ because it has this higher dimensional quality to it but it's a part of humanness it can't be taken away from it but its relationship to the brain is is very specious and too much energy has been put into that the whole problem you see with psychedelic drugs is to really understand them you must take them and this poses problems that science normally doesn't have to grapple with scientists don't like that they like to stand as far away from their subject matter as possible and believe that it is running through its changes completely without their intercession or input and we're not getting a good picture of the activity of psychedelic drugs by giving them to prisoners or to people who have been pre-selected for some uh, pre-selected sociopaths what i mean channeling? you mean channeling voices and that kind of thing i mean experiencing not standing away from them and well no you have to stand into it this has been the problem you see the whole thing in the 19th century all all sciences wanted to emulate physics in terms of the elegance of the predictability the highly mathematicized uh, way in which quantity could be assigned to all the values manipulated and all to be a science that's what it meant to be as much like physics as possible and it's always eluded psychology i mean psychology is uh, just whistling in the wind in terms of being a science because sciences usually start out with a definition of their subject matter and psyche we're still waiting you know there are only contentious voices being heard so i think that the the challenge of the psychedelics is uh, a total challenge a challenge to science a challenge to each of us personally a challenge to the notion that history has become an unavoidable part of being human and uh, it's a frontier it's uh, it's the call of the future and we can make the future come to be to the degree that we explore and exemplify this thing it is you know that mind looms large in the future of humanity and that psychedelics are actually catalysts for mind they speed the cultural the reaction which we call cultural development can be vastly speeded up by the injection of psychedelics into a social system 
and this is what happened in the 1960s, and people are still reeling from it. I mean, they'll never recover from it. It was too much, and it, it continues. Karen, uh, uh, I've reason uh, to believe that not everyone who takes a sufficient amount of mushrooms and lies down uh, in darkness hears the teaching of the mushroom. And so then you have trouble agreeing upon or getting any agreement upon the, the teaching of the mushroom. And I don't know if this has to do with someone not working through enough personal stuff to be able to hear beyond, or, but I was wondering if you could comment on that. Well, I always think of Dr. Leary's uh, marvelous advice, which was, when in doubt, double the dose. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, <clears throat> we did a very interesting survey, which was we surveyed about 370 people who had taken psilocybin. And, and in fact, were more involved in that. They are actually <coughs> were people who were involved in attempting to grow it, 370 people. And that one of the questions in the questionnaire was, how much do you take? And the other question buried at some other portion of it was, uh, do you hear voices? And when you plot ascending dose, you discover that the more you take, the more likely you are to hear voices. And that I think this is the problem. You can have outrageous experiences and not have reached the core. And people always want to stop too soon and say, well, this is it. We're not going to get any higher. This is <laughs> fine, you know. And just very recently, I had an experience. Uh, someone who came to my Esalen thing that I did in February, who uh, was also at a mushroom conference that I did last fall, and we've sort of had an ongoing discussion because he says, you don't give enough credit to LSD, and I don't understand what you mean by the vast differences between these things and this and that. So he called me the other day and said, uh, I finally got it, and now I'm a convert. I saw them, I heard them, I talked to them, and it was nine and a half grams necessary to put this guy into the correct perspective. Nine and a half grams is an appalling dose in my book. I mean, I've done eight grams, and it's okay, you know, but you're way, way over the limit. So it, it is not the first phenomenon you counter, encounter, or the second, or the third, but down deep, this thing can come. And also, I've noticed with it, it is, uh, it has to be sort of invoked. Uh, the first time I ever encountered the voices was on the DMT flash. The very first time I smoked DMT, I mean, a friend of mine brought it to me. I remember it was a rainy evening in February of 60, uh, 66. And he came to my house, and he was a very odd person to begin with. And he said, I have something you might be interested in. I had just taken LSD for the first time six months before and was all gung-ho. And I said, oh, wonderful, what is it? He said, it's a new drug, great, great, drag it out. What is it? What do you do? He said, well, I don't want to say too much about it. Let's just sit down and do it. And he had this glass pipe. And uh, I I, since I hadn't heard of it, I couldn't imagine it was going to be a bigger deal than LSD because I figured, you know, Life magazine keeps me informed of these things. <laughs> it's not going to take me by surprise. And I took a huge hit. And, uh, and it was, without a doubt, the greatest compressed moment of growth I ever hoped to go through in my <laughs> life. I mean, I stopped being a Marxist. I stopped <laughs> being a materialist. I stopped being a rationalist. And it took, you know, what, five seconds? It just, it killed those things. It cauterized them. <laughs> it burned them out beyond any possibility of ever uh, <laughs> reconstructing them. Just they were gone. It, it, the, the evidence was too overwhelming, you know? And, uh, and when I came down, I said, I can't believe it. And that was all I could say for about 20 minutes. It was like ideological shock. I said, I can't believe it. I cannot believe it. I just can't believe it. I said, well, keep doing it. You'll believe it. <laughs> but the, see, the truth was I could believe it. I couldn't stop believing it. And yet I had not been prepared. 
I had not thought that magic ruled the world from top to bottom, side to side, atom to atom, from first to last. It had just not been in my conception to conceive of that. But that's a very violent way to contact the Logos. What I notice on mushrooms is I come into the place where the potential exists and I can recognize it. It's when the hallucinations have made the transition from geometric to visionary. You say, aha, now we're getting close to the place. And then I call them and I and I, I think elf calling is actually a tradition in certain cultures. You set your mind in a certain way, and then you say, you know, I'm here. Come in, little green men. Come in, little green men. And it begins like a like a like a self um, like a self-driven thought a thing. It's far away. It's like the tinkling of bells. It's the elf caravan. It's coming <laughs> closer and closer. Say, here I am. Come in. Come in. And then usually a, a good deep hit of Mazari Sharif uh, hash at this point <laughs> will usually do the trick. And you just take an enormous hit of hash, clamp down on it, close your eyes, look deep in, and they will, it will there will be what Mersilion, God bless his heart, since he's not a psychedelico, what he calls a rupture of plane will occur. <laughs> this is what you're after, the rupture of plane. It means that you pass through a membrane of some sort and you're in a place. You mean a cognitive membrane that's holding you from seeing what's beyond? Yeah, sort of like thing. that. You're just like pushed through and uh, you see the the tykes is the technical term that I evolved <laughs> for them. The self-transforming machine elves that are singing in the hyperdimensional language. And they surround you and say, Welcome, we're so glad to see you. You come so rarely. It's so nice that you're here. We love you. And they're sort of climbing all over you. And, and this kidney thing. And after having experienced it many times, I'm convinced it's someone's idea of a of a receiving area or playpen. It's someone very odd has the idea that this is a reassuring environment for human beings. And and it you have the feeling of being in a playpen. It's padded and there are these glittering, fascinating, transforming things. And plus elves who could wish for more in a playpen. And the elves are playing with these things and saying, see what we're doing? See what we're doing? Do you want to do this? You can do this. Watch what we're doing. And they are speaking a language which is somehow puns, which are visual, which are multiply perceived by you on many levels. They are doing something, in other words, as, as, as beyond language, as language is beyond the inarticulate croak of a loon, you know. And they're saying, you can do this. There's nothing special about this. Making objects with our voices, freestanding objects which are changing and transforming themselves, and in fact themselves beginning to sing and speak and produce more objects. We want you to do this. And because it will make you happy, because you will feel good. Isn't this a riot? Have you ever felt better in your life? And then, you know, the sinking back, the fading out, the and they always the final farewell, they sing deja vu. <laughs> where you get this transformation of geometric pattern into the visionary realm. It happens with all psychedelics. It's the transition from peripheral hypnagogia to deep visionary states. I don't know if you know the work of Ronald Siegel at UCLA, but he works on hallucinations. And he, I mean, he's a nice man and all, but this idea he has that all hallucination, that there's a grammar of hallucinations and that all hallucinations can be reduced to 15 basic types which are 
in intermixing, you know, the wavy line, the star, the dot, is he says in the last paragraph of most of his published articles, we are speaking, of course, of the onset of, hip of hallucination and the hypnagogia associated with it. In other words, he's not talking about anything worth talking about. <laughs> he's talking about the very edge where, yes, of course, you see drifting lights and shimmering fields of color and then it grows more geometric. But that, what you are looking at, is the surface of the wall. What you want is what is on the other side of the wall. Beyond it, you have to push through it. And uh, all studies of hallucination have used threshold doses. They just creep up to it. They elicit the faintest sort of hallucination. And the real hallucinations are a total challenge uh, to our concept of how the visual cortex, the brain, the world, the language forming ability, I mean, my God, what is going on with these things? They are really worth uh, studying. They are, you know, to think that that's your mind, that you can get your mind so out in front of you that you can look at it, it means it's worth doing because your mind, after all, how often do you look at it, carry it with you? So even a drug as strange as the Tura? get you over to the other side of the wall no. in the same place? I don't think so. They're, the quality of the hallucinations, what I've been ba basically speaking of, are the beta-phenylethylamine hallucinogens, which would be uh, LSD, uh, DMT, psilocybin, and then it may happen with other things, but I can't speak from experience, possibly mescaline, possibly a bogaine. No, the hallucinations of Datura are very, are not highly colored, science fiction-y, highly polished, futuristic objects imbued with otherness. The hallucinations of Datura are uh, almost occulty, 19th century, shimmering, diaphanous, indistinct. Uh, they seem to be come from a watery, darker, more gothic place in the unconscious. No, I'm not... And ketamine is another one. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with it. A totally artificial compound, uh, 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 veterinary anesthetic, that induces a very odd experience that I suppose, because every notion has its limiting case, that I suppose you would have to call psychedelic but it's an odd kind of psychedelic. The hallucinations are not brightly colored, they're not clearly presented and perceivable, and they have more the quality of after images, you know, the chartreuses and lemon yellows of, of uh, pressure on the eyelid type stuff. The, the true hallucinogens, I think, are a very small family of drugs that will induce this. And that's why it's so important to study structure-activity relations, because surely the clue to what they are doing, or a partial clue to what they are doing, must lie in the, in the structure of them. How are we doing for time? Half what time is it? 4.30. 4 4 Good. How do the, the kind of visions that you've been describing, how might this relate to the whole UFO phenomenon? The, the kind of experiences people have with... Well, I think uh, that... Uh, a phenomenon, you know, I spoke earlier of, of how we are culturally on a collision course with a higher dimension and how the dimension will be fully manifested when we all are in it and that the psychedelic experience is a phenomenon which is carrying certain people toward it. Uh, okay, so far that's all review. The UFO is like... Uh, a collective uh, psychedelic experience, which is haunting time like a ghost. In other words, the consequence of repressing the onset of the future is the outbreak of a symptom of psychic disequilibrium. In other words, what the flying saucer is, is it's an autonomous portion of the mass psyche that is adrift through time, and what it's doing is it is changing people's minds. 
a very interesting way of approaching flying saucers has been developed in the last five years. They've basically given up on what is it, where does it come from, who's inside it. This has been <laughs> totally unrewarding, this approach. So a new approach has been brought forward called, what is it doing? We don't care what it is or where it came from or who's inside of it. What is it doing? Well, it turns out you can find out what the saucer is doing not by studying the saucer, but by studying human populations. And you discover what the saucer is doing is, number one, it's eroding people's faith in science. This is a curious effect that the saucer is having. The science's inability over 30 years now to offer a convincing explanation is causing people to believe that scientists are stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, that, th that flying saucers and whoever is behind them uh, know more than scientists know. Uh, Something like 11% of the American population claim to have seen a flying saucer. That's over 1 in 10. Uh, something like 30% uh, believe they are real, whatever that means. It means you don't believe they're not real, is what it means. So, and as these statistics are clocked, as they have been since the middle 50s, the faith in the saucers is rising. It's continuously growing, and it's a millenarian kind of hysteria. It's a phenomenon of the lower classes. It is not, I mean, in California it may not be, because we're all such squirrels, we'll <laughs> go for anything. But say in, uh, say in the East or England or somewhere like that, b passionate belief in flying saucers is a, is a lower class phenomenon. In, uh, educated, intelligent people do not believe in flying saucers and I've been at dinner parties where you know everything was going along fine and we were talking about uh, psychedelic drugs and extraterrestrial life <laughs> and this and that but you mentioned flying saucers and it's just you believe that my good man but I think it is it is driving a wedge therefore between millions and millions of people and the official state faith of our culture which is science. Now, we can look back in history to another time when this same thing happened. It is in the phenomenon of Christianity, mm. where what you had was a, an empire of great sophistication and great cynicism uh, built on Roman military power and the projection of Greek philosophical ideas. The people who administered that empire, your workaday Roman administrator of the first century, will say, was uh, a rationalist, a materialist, a believer in Democritian atomism, somebody who offered sacrifice to the gods, but just basically to keep his bets covered, but somebody who was pretty confident, you know, that Democritian atomism, Epicurean rationalism was what was going on, administering a world-girdling empire, very no-nonsense kind of operation. Comes now the word that in the kitchen Jews and Greeks and people of dark skin brought in from the fringes of the empire are talking about some Jewish rabbi, some radical who rose for the, from the dead and, and, and why it's just laughable, it's uh, grotesque, it's the kind of thing servants believe. And so who needs to bother with that? We have real problems in Judea with the, you know, keeping down these zealots and these Jewish radical groups with political leanings. And so it wasn't taken seriously. In a world where information could move only at the speed of a horse's gallop, within 30 years it was hammering at the gates of Rome. Within 120 years, the emperor had to convert. Within 200 years, uh, the empire itself was Christian. And, and uh, hydrostatics, mathematics, hydraulics, engineering, these things all came to a screeching halt. Nothing was done. One thing mattered. 
studying the words of a single Jewish rabbi on human behavior. Anybody who was not spending their time doing that had not understood that the good word had come from Jerusalem. And for a thousand years, society was in stasis. Nothing happened. We just adumbrated the Christian message and studied its implication. Now, what happened and why did it happen? What happened was that Rome was a, a, an imperial <coughs> nightmare, a fascist superstate based on slavery and exploitation of captive populations. And it was on the brink of immense scientific breakthroughs. The, the mathematics of Diophantus were probably within 50 years could have issued into a calculus of some sort. I mean, they were probably within 500 years of flight to the moon when the Christians reached Rome and put them through the monkey ranch. <laughs> so, so what happens is that human culture is actually a cohesive whole. And as society inevitably begins to fall out of balance, usually in the direction of materialism, militarism, and dehumanizing tendencies of all sorts. Well, when that begins to happen, there's, it's like a governing device in the superego. The button is pushed, and it says, look at the dominant ideology responsible for the cultural situation, and send a force which will turn it upside down. For Roman imperialism, the flying saucer was Jesus Christ, you know. They had been expecting him for centuries, a messiah to arise out of the tribes of Judea, and there were people who claimed to be the messiah, and it didn't quite fit astrologically in this way. And, that. and then finally, bang, somebody got the formula right, the true messiah, and the empire is swept away, Greek mystery religions are exterminated, the knowledge of the ancient world is destroyed. The whole thing is established uh, in the uh, patristic early Christian model. Now we have an even worse situation, the same thing but on a global scale, a vast imperial force built on dehumanizing ideologies, uh, economic enslavement, manipulation of the mass mind through propaganda, uh, all of the evils of modernity, and none of the ethical uh, maturity that you would hope would balance that out. So the cultural governor shifts into being again and says, you know, a flying saucer would turn this scene completely upside down. And it, it is and it will. We may be in the pre-contact phase. Something may come out of the mass unconscious of the race that will look for all the world like a starship from another solar system. In the same way that Jesus Christ looked for all the world like God made man. It's, it's that the superego has this unique ability to know the weaknesses of the mass mind, to push exactly what buttons to push. When you say super ego, do you mean overmind? Yeah, the overmind. It knows exactly what buttons to push to pull a culture one way or another. So I think the message of the flying saucer is, uh, or the purpose of the flying saucer, is to, is to slow the growth of science, to allow ethics a time to catch up with it. But you see, it's a pitiless historical mechanism because I don't want to live in one of those worlds where we all study the words of Christ or a flying saucer. I don't like these ideologically monolithic periods in history where everyone is so sure they have the answer that they go around burning out everybody who disagrees. I think that Part of the maturity of the human species has to do with evolving beyond the need for these metaphysical spankings from the superego. <laughs> we, we don't need messiahs or flying saucers if we can become responsible for our destiny. These are, are things used to keep children in line. And uh, the psychedelic experience <laughs> and psychedelic drugs offer a way of anticipating 
the flying saucer, getting to know it before it arrives in a flurry, so that when it does arrive, you know what it is. And because if it should come, if our cultural imbalance is so great that a miracle is going to be required of the superego, when it comes, all hell will break loose. I mean, you can imagine the impact if suddenly the word was flashed that an enormous artificial object was in orbit around the Earth, and within minutes, uh, high, uh, ultra-high-resolution cameras can be brought to bear on that thing, and it can be conveyed to every television screen on the planet. And to behold it is to lose your footing, because remember, it was constructed by the superego, for the, by the overmind, for the specific purpose of getting your goat. In the same way that in the Hellenistic world, when people said, have you heard about the Christians? You say, no, what are the Christians? You say, there are these people, and they believe that you should love your neighbor, and you say, hmm. This is weird. This rap you're giving me is getting to me. It's doing something to my mind. I'm believing it in spite of myself because the historical moment is so ripe for it. And science would be the first to go. I mean, Carl Sagan, all these people would be lined up <laughs> saying, yes, well, we always knew the star density, the presence of biological molecules throughout the galaxy, the Drake equation. We always knew that it would be this way, you know. But then I think the saucer would deliver the message. <clears throat> this is how this cultural governor works. It delivers a message. And then the most shattering part of all is it leaves. And everybody who wasn't alive while it was here misses it. And for the next thousand years, <laughs> people say, you know, what was it? What did it mean? What does it mean for us? What are we supposed to do? What was the message? Are we getting it right? Are we getting it wrong? Why didn't it stay? Now we are bereft again, cosmically abandoned. When will it return? And it's just this whole childish thing, you know, about not realizing that uh, until society places its ethics on as high a plane of development as its techni or all these other things, why we're going to be subject to these nasty surprises from the overmind. And I don't think these nasty surprises from the overmind happen to non-historical and historical societies with a tradition of shamanism, because I think shamanism is immersion in the object at the end of history and thereby somehow it is in a way present in the here and now and so living in the light of eternity the vicissitudes of history just simply do not arise and uh, so the flying saucer which you might not think and for most people is not connected with psychedelic drugs or any of these other things for me I think it's a central motif because uh, I've had experiences with flying saucers I observed it very closely, and I've noticed about flying saucer contacts, the people that you read about never, it, it seems to prefer the lower classes. It's always telephone linemen and people who are just leaving the diner and this and that. It avoids, uh, it avoids phenomenologists, PhDs in much of anything. And, but I got, you know, perhaps it's because I never got my degree that it came so close. <laughs> but, <clears throat> but I got a clear glimpse of what it was, and I saw beyond the first veil, which is the ship from another world, beyond the second veil, which is, I don't know what, to, I think this is what it is. It's, uh, it's, the, it's, uh... Selectively vigilant mass illusion. <laughs> something like that. The way I put it was, I said, I think it's, it's the cursor of God's reality processor. When you see the blinking light in the sky, it means there's about to be a text insertion or deletion. Yeah.